wait for two minutes to we'll start. Recording in progress. Hello and welcome everyone to today's first webinar on the hidden world inside Earth, unlocking the mystery of the gut microbiome. I'm Dr. Jini Nair and I'll be moderating today's webinar. So now we would like to start off the session by introducing our company. So we'll introduce you to her Neom and Maiji through a short video. So the vision is to provide a unique, innovative approach of biobanking. We have a novel proprietary product called InstaPreserve that can help us to store the biospecimen at ambient temperature. We believe that this can revolutionize the biobanking. We offer, in addition to this, we offer customers the genomics research and services through cutting-edge technologies using next-generation sequencing and real-time assay. We also undertake many projects to support customers in their research. In addition, we also offer customized training programs. Can you just share the slide, please? Yeah, you just play the video first. It's a strategic division of new, which aims at rapid with cutting edge innovation. Our vision is to further advancements in biobanking and drive genomics research innovation to deliver faster and more affordable medical care. Our unique product called InstaPreserve is a technology for biospecimen collection, transportation, and long term ambient temperature storage system. We have stored different biospecimens in Insta. System. At low cost, you can maintain a world class biorepository. In addition, we also offer customized training programs. We have adopted a unique approach of problem-based learning and have customized training for medical students and clinicians. We have trained participants from different organizations such, such as Sri Chitra Wildlife Institute of India. So we will start off this session. And if you have any questions, please free to type in, in the chat box and we will take up all the questions at the end of the webinar. Now, I would request Dr. Elongo to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Jinni. I am Dr. Elongo, Chief Operating Officer in EO. And we have taken much effort in uh, translating the scientific knowledge into the practical application, especially in the clinical side. So, we closely associate with scientists and uh, clinical fraternity and bring in the knowledge to everyone. And now this gut microbiome webinar is not only for the scientists, the researchers, and the clinicians, but it is for the common man. This information will be very useful to everyone, every man candidate will be fed out of this. And before going to the speakers, I would like to emphasize a point here that the audience are from different walks of life, and there are people different uh, scientific backgrounds. And especially the considerable percentage of our audience are from yoga and naturopathy science. The doctors from 
yoga and natural and ayurvedic science traditions the reason being is we are closely now associating with the national list of naturopathy pune where where we start with genetic and gut microbiome based studies on the naturopathy <laughs> but we already had a same program in pune and the same college for yoga natural sciences in dharmasthala and i am very sure that this webinar will be very interesting to everyone and the reason is being having dr tamodaran and dr vikram as our speakers and the main strength for this webinar today dr tamodaran i know him for more than 30 years and he has been a, a well educated and uh, ordered researcher in this field especially on the medical microbiology his background he has trained many researchers into doctorate students and got more than 20 phd students to his credit he has many publications in the international reputed journals he has been in the panel for different external board and the different education institution he has been a visiting faculty to many universities a lot away from and firstly he is in singapore and almost a he has become a full singaporean now uh, we would like him to come back to india to help us to bring about more probiotic uh, customized products to help the indian patient and now dr vikram and now he is a very ordinant gastroenterologist we were we worked together in narayana hridaya health city he has been very keen he is not a very a simple a clinician he himself is a clinical uh, research person who is very keen to get into many the practical approaches of the different technology into that so now we are very closely associated with him in gut microbiome to help the patients to recover fast and also to develop a customized probiotic treatment to the patients now over to the speakers i have request dr tamodaran to start with the basic uh, information about the mysteries of the gut microbiome followed by dr vikram who will present his clinical issues and how with the clinical perspective how the gut microbiome will help a clinician to treat the patients now over to dr tamodaran thank you so much dr elango uh, my good friend uh, i know him for more than since 1990 january so i i know elango when he was in his uh, masters time and um, nice to associate with this uh, talk on the world microbiome day on uh, this uh, ordinary day today and good to see dr vikram beliappa who is a uh, eminent uh, gastroenterologist sir nice meeting you sir nice, nice uh, meeting you sir so much and i could see here is a wonderful team because we have a a team of uh, basic scientists and also um, i am not sure about the background of uh, jenny and a uh, wonderful administrators and medical doctor dr vikram here and me and uh, elango as a basic uh, scientific uh, people so it it forms like a looks like wonderful uh, team here i could see and today the topic is on uh, microbiome because it's a, it's it's a, it's a more relevant to uh, today's world microbiome day but thank you so much elongo for inviting and for miss jenny to making all these attempts to make this as a real happening today so uh, let me uh, share my uh, slides today give me a second okay you like i just want to confirm uh, can you see my slides moving right yes yes your slides are clear yes okay fantastic thank you so much okay again uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this wonderful uh, talk today and um, today we talk about microbiome which is unlocking the mysteries of uh, microbiome and we have wonderful a uh, team of audience here and uh, 
thank you so much for my gene bangalore for for inviting me for this wonderful uh, talk okay to start with as a microbiome right so microbiome is basically the microbiota complete microbiota living in your entire body including your gut system your intestinal system your gastroenterologic system and also at several parts of your body including your skin so this overall thing will form the complete microbiome now the question is that uh, how are they going to associate with your body and as a modern researchers how are we going to translate this knowledge of making this microbiome not to be harmful to you but to be uh, most beneficial to your body and also for the future generation so that must be the approach of this uh, microbiome more than all microbiome is not a new thing when we when the through the evolutionary process when the human race started the microbiome also started thing is that they diversified into different uh, phyla different families and different groups based on their adaptation based on their physiology based on different types of mutation they went through during the course of time look at this microbiome uh, it's it's like uh, i could name it like the uh, microbial communities within the human communities as you could notice in this diagram they are very well present in the system mouth and throat nose stomach vaginal region and skin which is all over the body in addition to this you can see them at different parts so basically you can define them as uh, microorganisms that live in the highly established environment of your body whereas microbiome is a full complement of microbes we have different classifications like a firmicutes bacteroids and and so on and through their genes and genomes how they could adapt to a particular environmental condition is the most common thing talking about the total number of cells bear in mind you have about 10 trillion cells in the human body among the 10 trillion cells in the human body as a supra organism you have 90 trillion cells so now the question is that who is ruling whom are we ruling the microbiome or microbiome are ruling you that's the first question so in terms of number you go for the count in terms of the head count they are the winners because they have 90 trillion cells in your body whereas your whole body contains about 10 trillion cells so who is bigger in number so they are bigger in number but in terms of the size and the mass they are around 800 to 1200 or 1300 grams in weight which is scattered all over your body and more especially in the gut microbiome so remember at any point point of time i use I, i use a very strong word at any point of time sorry dr vikram for using this word at any point <laughs> of time this microbiomes can annihilate or destroy the whole world because you have 90 trillion cells in every single human body so we have to be so friendly with them let us not harm them that's a very 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 important point i could i could notice from this diagram here the more is the transition they get into more disease the more is the favorable condition like using appropriate count of antibiotics and less mutations and don't turn them to be from harmful to harm from harmless to harmful and you will be more in a healthier condition so remember the 90 trillion cells even one person of the 90 trillion cells can turn back to become a vigorous and then become pathogenic or virulent so that is the end of the human race and that's what we are learning from the flu pandemic and now covid pandemic and earlier on there are more than eight pandemics of cholera and many pandemics of influenza and many pandemics of tuberculosis and so on so these are the lessons we have to learn from how this bacteria and microbiome teaching the lesson to us so don't try to make them a kind of a harmful reservoir in your body so i use the word reservoir because you are going to have at one point of time in your own human body you are going to have the harmful bacteria if you are going to harm them by using inappropriate or abundant use of antibiotics and so on and other 
epigenetic factors, including the diet you have every day. So these are the, uh, the triggering factors for the microbiome from harm less to harmful. So we have a funny diagram to, to show you that, you know, there are billions of cells in our, trillions of cells in our body. And in terms of the uh, microbiome, there are about 22,000 uh, genomes have been uh, recorded in the human body, whereas where you can expect around 3.3 million genes from the uh, 90 trillion cells. And imagine you can see the permutations and combination of mutations in every microbiome. So approximately it's about, I, I normally say around uh, from the pediatric age group to adults, right? It's starting from 0.75 uh, gram, uh, kilogram, 0.75 kilogram, which is 750 um, um, gram, 2,200 gram is the actual weight. But human, we know that we are homo sapiens, only one species. But if you talk about the, uh, the species of uh, microbiome or microbiota, you can expect up to 5,000 different species, of which about four or five uh, different classes from the family, like formicutes, bacteroids, are the most predominant uh, families. Talking about the genes, as you can expect here, more than four million genes are there in the microbiome. And imagine about the combinations of mutations. And you have around 25,000 genomes in your body. So human microbiome, there is a growing awareness on this. I'm sure Dr. Vikram agreed that, uh, I mean, I have been working with a gastroenterologist both in Chennai and also in Singapore for the last 35 years. And it's been very hard to make them to believe. I mean, no offense, Dr. Vikram. It's, uh, it's always between the basic research scientist and the medical doctor. 25 years before, I told to my Singapore professor here that, you know, there is a gut microbiome. Can we start a project on it? He said, bullshit, I don't want to do that. He's a gastroenterologist. But I, I gave him a suggestion that uh, uh, I can bring some, uh, some extract from India and from plant extract, which I learned from my grandma, in fact. Whenever I have some tummy problem, she used to give that. Then he gave me an indirect permission that, okay, you can, you can go ahead with some students, but not trouble my routine gastro work. So I started a small project about 25 years before here, using some traditional Indian medicinal plants, and they have been very useful. And he started trusting me for the past few decades, about two decades. First five years is a hard time for me to, to prove that, you know, we have, we have some good news from uh, the natural sources. Because I believe in one thing that we all have come from nature. So the nature is the solution for most of the problems. So when the nature gives the uh, fantastic uh, uh, plants to cure, why not? So now, but then that has to be done in accordance with the, uh, what you call the comprehensive knowledge by the gastroenterologist. That's why I'm so lucky to have, if I want uh, antrums uh, biopsy, I tell my boss, he'll give me antrum biopsy because I want to check helicobacter pylori. If I want carpus, if I want some little bit of duodenum from human sample, we used to have the ethical committee approval and I used to, as a basic scientist, I can just go to level three where we have the endoscopy section. I, I was in the basement one in the, in the lab. So I just go there and collect whatever the samples I want. So that is the interaction between the basic research scientist and the gastroenterologist, which has been successful in our team for the last 30 years. And because of that, it, it is the reason that, uh, you know, from, the, from a very simple department of about four or five doctors, now we have around 45 plus gastroenterologists in one department. It's growing, both research as well as the as well as the clinical side. So that is the advantage of having a kind of a, 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 a roof where you have the uh, couple of scientists and the gastroenterologists together to work as one team. I always believe in that, and that is a lesson me and Elango also learn from the postgraduate institute of basic medical sciences because you have medical doctors there as well as the basic scientists there. It's a one umbrella where. We have the play around between medical doctors and uh, research scientists. So you can share different ideas. So the awareness on microbiome has been growing. And you can see them at various sites in your normal flora, skin and mucous membranes. Upper respiratory tract is all over the body. Gastrointestinal tract, external genitalia, vaginal region, external ear canal, and external eyelids. Even they could uh, overcome the uh, lysozyme secretions. You could appreciate this uh, picture here. The pie chart 
illustrate the percentage of frictionless rRNA gene sequences representing the dominant bacterial phyla, which comes from the uh, mostly those brown color pie charts is like semicules. And then you can have these uh, blue charts from the uh, actinobacteria. And then yellow one is always from the uh, bacteroids. These are the most predominant uh, groups of, so there are four groups that are most predominant, firmicutes, bacteroids, and proteobacteria, and actinobacteria. So most of the probiotics, which we are trying to design now to help the human communities, are coming from these four major classes, and more especially from the firmicutes and bacteroids. Talking about the, uh, the spreading nature of these microbes, you can appreciate that uh, the percentage is more high in uh, oral region because most of the, uh, the story of the GI tract starts from the fecal oral route. That's what we believe in always. And that is the most powerful route as well. That's why we always believe that I'm a strong believer of gut immunity. When you have the intestinal or gut immunity, because any, anything you eat, any epigenetic factor, any pesticides you swallow, you go through the nasal route, all go through the pharyngeal region. Even with COVID-19, how come it can infect so much? It's because it's the pharyngeal region is the culprit. The pharynx is the, of the human body has got a lot of receptors for most of the bacterial and viral communities. So the pharyngeal region, in scientific uh, term, we call it as the primary site of multiplication. Meaning to say, the less number of fecal-oral microbiome go there, multiply in a larger number, then go inside to fight against your body. But your body is not a stupid, it's a clever. So you have a lot of mucus secretions. And the most powerful thing is you have the natural antibodies in the form of immunoglobulin G and also in the form of secretory immunoglobulin A in the gut system. So when you have the fantastic gut system, that's why we always insist that uh, especially the newborn babies, we always recommend, strongly appeal to all the mummies to feed, you know, to do the breastfeeding. Because you give the colostrum and also freely available secretory monoglobulin A comes from the breastfeeding. So the, the child will be more healthier and also able to face all kinds of uh, challenges of the future microbiomes in case if they are harmful, like rotavirus, Novak virus, all kinds of epidemics. So according to World Health Organization, Right, it's been told that most of the uh, developing countries and also Asian countries, every newborn child undergo three to five episodes of diarrhea due to rotavirus, Novak virus, or any bacterial uh, infections. They undergo three to five episodes of diarrhea before they attain the age of 18 months. So that means every before one and a half year, every Asian child will undergo three to five episodes of diarrhea. And then you look at the death rate also, very high. So the solution is, the primary solution is that you need to have the adequate quantum of secretory monoglobulin A at the gut system because it goes through the fecal oral route. So when you have the gut system in a stronger manner, you can overcome almost all kinds of challenges. So what we need is the uh, lactate, I mean, mother feeding. So most of the areas, I repeat the slide again, uh, so... It's a fantastic job here. It's like a factory starting from the mouth all the way to your buccal cavity. At the, every site, you have a specific function, and then you have the pharyngeal region, then your trachea, and it goes to respiratory root and also esophagus, and going to tummy, and you have your antrum, your larger curvature, and then your duodenum, jejunum, ileum, cecum, colon, rectum, anus. So this GI tract starting all the way from mouth is going to be the most powerful tool of the microbiome world. So when you have this area in a stronger manner in your human gut system, you can always have the most powerful and most friendly, what we call symbiotic microbial community. And through which you can achieve a good natural immunity or gut immunity. So is it like a friend or fee or enemy? Most of the time they are our friends. You need to really have them as a friends. What are the benefits of normal flora? They're able to synthesize, help you. You know, It's a symbiotic relationship. I told you earlier, we are only 10 trillion cells and they are 90 trillion cells. So we have in harbor them. That means you give them a free site with no rental, no deposit permitted. So they go inside, multiply in the 90 trillion cells, no agreement at all. 
but you are only 10 trillion cells. So you have the symbiotic relationship. You give them the shelter and they give you vitamin K, vitamin B12, also prevent other pathogenic bacteria to colonize your body and also antagonize other harmful bacteria, stimulate the development of most of your tissues, including your bone marrow tissue, capillary density, lymphatic tissues, and also the intestinal arrangement. Stimulate the production of cross-reactive antibodies because you have the multifactorial antibodies, which is very common, and you need to have them to fight against the invading pathogens. So these are the multiple helps available from microbiomes. It's again the same uh, with the different 20 different jobs done by microbiome. And you need to have a healthy uh, system. What we say in normal uh, setting is right, you know, germ-free mice can become ill and challenge with even just 10 simple salmonella cells, germ-free mice, because you don't expose them to any kind of a challenging atmosphere. But a mice which is exposed to a challenging atmosphere, freely grown mouse, even you, you give them about 10 to the power 2 or 10 to the power 6, up to 10 to the, that much of uh, salmonella cells, right? They still not able to, susceptible to any of this pathogenic bacteria. That tells you a simple message that you need to have the na normal natural habitat in order to overcome the invading pathogens. How do we acquire this residential flora? Number one is the dispersal from the birth mode, from the delivery, and also from mother feeding. These are the most important routes at which the child from the birth, attending all the way to a toddler, you tend to get the different, uh, what you call, a pattern of uh, the firmicutes, bacteroids, and so on. It tells you that, uh, you know, the, the, the newborn baby's stool, is a very interesting. It's not only the stool, it contains the, uh, the mucus and other ingredients which comes from the mother and from the first month to six months and to 12 months and then to a toddler, they tend to get a pattern of different microbial communities. So it starts from the birth and once the child become a toddler, right, they're able to get the natural immunity because the immune system started developing. So you need to have the a strong immune system as a newborn baby, and that can come mostly from your mother, which is through the uh, secretory immunoglobulin A, and also through the, the actual mucus, which is not only the stool which the baby has got, it has also got the mother's uh, content through the colostrum. So the spectrum of microbiota coming from the, uh, the baby all the way to uh, elderly, when start from the sterile gastrointestinal tract at the time of pregnancy and also to embryo and then give birth, infancy, and then to adulthood. Elderly, you can see most of the firmicutes, bacteroids, and bifidobacteria. So bifidobacteria is one of the very interesting uh, group of family from uh, bacteroids, and also lactobacillus coming from firmicutes. So these are the most fantastic, uh, what you call the probiotic bacteria currently under research by many investigators. So talking about the diet also plays a very important role. The more towards the Western diet, you, would, you, you change towards that, right? You tend to get more chronic disease. I'm not telling about everyone, but you tend to change. A Asian become Western and Western become Asian food. This, this could be the one, of the one of the transition. And in the Mediterranean diet, you know, most of the gut microbiota will be more uh, strong and harmless. Western countries experiencing a lot of uh, immune diseases like Crohn's, uh, IBD, ulcerative colitis, type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, and allergy with the different forms. Even most of the, uh, or many of the European and Western communities are allergic to even peanut. Multiple sclerosis and metabolic diseases, colorectal cancer, CRC, autistic loss of microbiota diversity is the main reason for all this because they tend to change the epigenetic nature. They tend to change the malnourishment, tend to change the imbalanced or unbalanced diet. So pathogen domination is the most crucial factor and also medications, especially as strong intake of uh, uh, NSAIDs like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and uh, antibiotics, steroids and painkillers 
Brufen, Ibu Brufen, Nephraxen, and the statin families, cholesterol reducing drugs uh, high, uh, to reduce the blood pressure. So these are the major cause of making the microbiome to change from the normal microbiota to a harmful microbiota. Variations in oral microbiota also associated with oral cancer. So there is a what he called a drift, a genetic drift uh, at the uh, microbial community in the oral region can alter this. So this could be one of the cause of the uh, oral cancer. So there are several biomarkers available because of the time. I'm not elaborating so much on this. And you can do them in the in-house uh, technology like what we do now with the COVID-19. You know, the kids have been sent to our houses and we can do by ourselves. So oral health is linked to oral uh, oral health is linked to overall health. That's a very important thing. So you need to have the oral health. And in the oral health, if you trigger, you need you may get most of the strokes and the respiratory disease, arthritis, diabetes, GI tract infections. Uh, preterm and low birth weight babies. So these are the another cause of the change in the nature of oral microbiome. And uh, I'm a strong believer of uh, these four concepts, which I've been reading for the past 25 years. And uh, very seriously, when I was proposing these uh, points to around, uh, I came to Singapore in 1996, 98, I proposed this concept to an eminent scientific group of gastroenterologists, but not much of a, uh, uh, reception came, but then um, I start developing my own uh, concept of reading it. So now we have concluded, you know, the scientific community started agreeing on this. 25 years before, people were laughing at it. Now we have four different brains. It's not the only brain in the in the skull. It's the brain you have in the uh, head brain, you call a skull brain, like normal brain you have. Then you have the heart brain, which is your heart. And then your gut brain, your gut system, gastrointestinal system. And also there is a fourth brain is called the uh, enteric nervous system inside the gut. So these are the four important brains. Currently, the entire scientific community and the research community and gastroenterologists and microbiologists and pathologists totally agreed on this. And last time, people thought the communication is only command come only from the brain to other parts of the body through neurons, synaptic transmission and uh, peripheral transmission and central transmission, impulse conduction and so on. But now it has been proven that the gut system can communicate back to brain, okay? Meaning to say that, uh, you know, I don't have to agree with you. When brain says something, do this. Then gut can repeat, say that, are you a fool? I don't have to agree with you. It, with this, this has been happening from several billions of years from the, from the evolution of the human birth. But we started believing this for the past only around two and a half decades. So the gut, is communicating back to brain, it has been recorded that 450 times more powerful than the actual brain. So the gut is the most powerful region to communicate back to brain and even uh, command the brain what to do and what not to do as well. And also heart and the intestinal or enteric lining of the nervous system also communicate back to brain. It was thought once, if you look at all our uh, uh, physiology friends, our anatomy friends, right? They say only brain command, you know, we receive the command. Now, remember, my dear friends, the gut system can command back to brain 400 times more powerful than the actual brain, which is which has been commanding to other parts of the body. And that's why I'm insisting when you have a fantastic gut system, when you have a very strong and clear and vital and healthier gut system, your day will be most happier. You don't get angry. You don't get depression. You don't get any stress, nothing. I don't get any stress, seriously, for the past almost like 15 years. Nobody can stress me also. Because I understand that this is the concept. So when you have the, the, the most healthier gut immunity in the gut system, try to replace all the harmful ones using bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, and most of the beneficial bacteria. And that it could really help you to avoid most kind of uh, depression, stress, and so on. And then the other side, re regarding your health and physiology, you can overcome most of the medical diseases, starting from your cardiovascular, starting from your liver diseases, pancreatic cancer, spleen problems, and no need to remove your gallbladder, 
there are so many problems can be solved because when you talk about the gut system, it includes your stomach, not only the stomach, it includes your liver, spleen, and pancreas, and gallbladder as well. So when you want to have this uh, fantastic system and a stronger immunity, right, you need to have the most powerful, harmless probiotic microbiome in your gut system. And that is the most important solution for the future communities. If you want to really create an intelligent community in the future, ask your children to have the, a good gut system. When the child grows normally, you don't have to educate them anything. So talk about four brains, just to give you a simple diagram. You have the simple human brain anatomy here. Last time, so complicated. Now I give more respect to my gut than the brain. And you have the heart, which is most powerful. You are interesting. And this is where the secret is here. Starting from the mouth, then you have the buccal cavity and the uh, esophagus, your stomach, then gut system got your liver, spleen, pancreas, everything. Then again, your pyloric junction, duodenum, jejunum, ileum, cecum, colon, rectum, anus. So this whole region, especially the, the antrum corpus, the larger curvature, the small curvature, until the pyloric junction. If you have the interesting microbiome, and then move on to all the way to duodenum, jejunum, ileum. You are the fantastic person. So you need to have the overall uh, most beneficial microbiome in this region. That could even prevent, I have a school of thought and the hypothesis that it could even prevent people getting into colorectal cancer. So this is something which I read from some journals and then I just put it here. Now we always listen to the uh, skull and now we need to listen to your heart and also your gut. So that's why people say gut feeling. Without our knowledge, for so many decades, even at, I would say so many centuries, we have been telling my gut feeling. Why do you say gut feeling? Because you know that something is there in the gut. Heart and that is very important. So follow your heart, trust your gut, and you need to really decide on that. So you just follow your heart, follow your brain, and then you decide by your gut feeling. So the gut is the long tube that starts at the mouth and ends at the back of the passage, which is the digestive system or anus. It also includes liver, pancreas, and gallbladder. Number of intestinal microbiota, I just repeat the slide again here. So just to let you know the, the youngsters and the, you know the school, those who are from the college, just to give you oral idea, you know, the simple idea that starting from oral cavity all the way to the rectum, just to give you a digestive system. We call this as a GI tract, gastrointestinal system. So let's focus on the microbial community in the gut. How is the community assembled and how does community composition affect the function? So the more and more is a harmful, which is the microbial biomass. The microbial biomass becomes more and more uh, healthier and you tend to get the fantastic and more intelligent microbes. Talking about the pH gradient, because that's another challenge for the microbial community. You look at here, from the colon all the way to the stomach, the pH is 1.5 to 5. Let us look at the colon, 5 to 7. That's why people hypothecate Sotococcus scalis could be one of the cause of colorectal cancer, because the pH here is the 5 to 7. And people, when uh, Barry Marshall, Robin Warren, when they proposed during 1982 about the Helicobacter pylori, nobody believed because the pH in the stomach is 1.5 to 5. Then they have to work on the, the, the actual pathological mechanism that, you know, helicobacter pylori can drill and bore in the intestinal lining because it's a helical shape. So it comes from outside and go inside and then cause the damage, get their food, whatever they need, and then go back. So it doesn't stay permanently inside the uh, pH of 1.5 or 2. That is the uh, reason they won the Nobel Prize in 2005. Back to the gut, you have the multifactorial, but the most important communities are stomachutes, bacteroids, actinobacteria, proteobacteria. So these are the four major groups of uh, microbiomes. It's a complicated scenario to give you a genetic network. And what defines a healthy GI tract microbiome in the USA? is just to give you a reference. You talk about actinobacteria, so the facultative anaerobes are very common there, like a bifido and actinobacillus. Stomachute 
can see here enterococcus and lactobacillus. That's why we have the facultative anaerobes like lactobacillus and uh, bifidobacterium are one of the major uh, selective organisms for making a kind of a, a probiotic um, food. And protein bacteria like E. coli and shigella, salmonella. We don't include them in the probiotics is because they tend to mutate more often. Bacteroids also, like uh, privatella, tend to become more uh, what you call prone to have mutations. So the most stable in the nature are the lactobacillus and the bifidobacterial communities. So just to give you a simple experiment that hypothesis that microbial communities can impact the risk of obesity, true or false. It has been experimented that different gut microbial communities structure in the obese mice, like formicutes and the bifidobacteroids. These two groups have been uh, taken. So the effects of dieting, as you could see here, the bacteroids, and those with the bacteroids, the mice become so lean, and uh, the one with the formicutes, the mice become so fat, and also they gain a lot of weight. What does it mean? The inoculation of the uh, microbial or microbiota fecal transplantation from the obese mice, purified, and then it's been orally fed to genetically engineered mice, which is not exposed to uh, germ-free mice, which is not exposed to any bacterial or other infections, and they could see that uh, they gain a lot of weight. So that could tell you that the transfer experiment said the hypothesis that microbiota were taken from the fat mice, transferred to germ-free recipients, and those that received the microbiota from obese donor gained more weight, even though they didn't eat more. So they didn't consume so much of food. That's why, you know, can you uh, transfer this knowledge to the human being? Some people, right, they are obese, they are very fatty, but you ask them, I don't eat so much. So they take only two idlis or one or two dose. And maybe Yelabo take 10 puris those days. I don't know now. I have to check. So again, putting the relative uh, abundance of microbiota is changing the function of the communities in a way that has been impact on the host. The take home message here is the bacteria isolated and purified from the obese mice can, can make the germ-free mice to become obese. And those comes mostly from the communities of Firmicutes and phyla. So just to repeat the same thing, enterotypes, Microbiota is starting from the birth. So human microbiome develops in the early part of the life. So microbiome expands and the genetic and functional capacity of its human host depends on the, the host nature. So many a times we must understand when we have epidemic or pandemic or even 1983, I was doing my um, bachelor's degree, HIV came, people thought only about HIV. They start blaming about HIV. When hepatitis came, start blaming about HIV. Polio came, blaming about polio virus. I used to ask only one question, even to my PhD professor. We always get arguments. How about the host factors? Are you keeping yourself all right? We never bothered about it. Host factors are the most predominant factors. So when you are clean, when you are having uh, uh, one single partner, why do you get HIV? It's a host factor. You see, it's a, it's a host psychology. So when you have the multisexual promiscuity, you tend to get HIV. That's because you have the some kind of a ulcers in the sexual route. So the virus can transfer into the through the ulcers, can reach the blood circulation, can impact the T4 cells and cause the damage. So whose fault is this? Is it a virus fault or the human fault? So most of the time, we have to blame that host factors are they do play most important role. So when a person is very slim, when a, when a boy is not gaining weight, he must check about, don't we simply think about, oh, any worms and germs are inside. But look at the host factors. What he's eating, how is his bone marrow, and what are his uh, total cell count? How, how, how is his macrophages are behaving? Are they identifying, able, do they able to identify the invading pathogenic factors? So these are the most important questions. Normally, I mean, Dr. Vigram has to excuse me. Most of the doctors also don't ask this. 
but the host factors are the most predominant. And that's why when you design any kind of a, a probiotic or symbiotic food, right, please design for the host factors. That must be assembled to or, or associated with the host factors. So population of the gut microbes shape the entire immune function and also relate to the disease outcomes on early childhood. So how you behave, how you tend to organize yourself. So microbiome, people start asking, is it just an organization of the group of microbial communities or an organ? Because I don't personally define it as an organ because they are scattered all over the body. So we can just simply say that they are the microbial community or microbiome as one whole structure scattered all over the body. Human microbiome refers to the collective genomes. Approximately, I know, again to repeat, about 90 to 100 trillion cells are there. What are the multiple functions? The first and foremost thing is the promotion of uh, fat storage and angiogenesis. Many a times when people do exercise, right, they tend to get angiogenesis. A couple of my friends, which Yelango knows, there's uh, Dr. Sundara Vadivel, they all stay with, with, with us in Chennai. They are now doing research on angiogenesis uh, for the last 30 years. I'm still in touch with them. They say that the people who walk so much and people who have a good microbiome in the, in the body, when you have a problem in the CVD, like cardiovascular disease or acute myocardial infarction, they tend to get the artificial angiogenesis. Your body tends to trigger the angiogenesis and also promote the formation of more, uh, what you call, angina. So you don't have to have the any blockages. If there is a blockage, and if you are a regular, uh, what you call, a person who walks so much, and if you if you have a good microbiome in the, in the body, they trigger to form the... Uh, angiogenesis and thereby you can avoid yourself getting into myocardial infarction or uh, any kind of a CVD, hypertension as well. So it, it plays a vital role. And development and training, it, they do train your immune system and also synthesis of multivitamins like uh, vitamin K and vitamin B12, which we don't normally synthesize, and metabolism of therapeutics, modification of your nervous system because they tend to connect back now. So last time is like one-way mechanism. Now it's like bidirectional or multidirectional. Breaking down of uh, food from compounds, resistance to pathogens. They train your body to identify different microbes. Even the microbiomes can associate with macrophages and train them also how to identify the invading pathogen and chop them into pieces. That's the job of macrophages. Protection against injury or any kind of a trauma or shock. Modulation of your bone mass density. It can overcome your own calcium deficiency, osteoporosis. It's also uh, thing to avoid the risk of your uh, rheumatoid arthritis as well. So alterations of the microbiome can aggravate the disease. Restoration of the microbiome should be more beneficial. This is the uh, most powerful thought. So scientific tools and models investigate the microbiome. Like this is the very important area for Ilongo and the team. So people, they use in vitro studies, in vivo studies. Nowadays, you don't have to culture the microbiome. You can just go by um, your genetic engineering technology. And there are a lot of challenges coming from outside to change the nature of microbiome coming from the birth mode, your diet, like, you know, so-called um, lifestyle and uh, pet ownership. Uh, this is another interesting thing in uh, modern communities. You know, people, last time we used to have pets, but uh, they, are, they are only pets. But now people start sleeping with the pets, start licking them, start kissing them. So there, is, there could be a, a strong exchange of the microbial community from the, from the pet dogs or pet cats to humans as well, and from humans to the pet cats as well. And who knows, sometimes when you transfer your good bifidobacterium, they become beneficial and you tend to get a canine thing. So that's a problem, be careful. So genetics is another alteration. Modi medication, you know, steroids, antibiotics, and stress is another, another interesting factor that could affect the, the, what you call the brain and gut axis. There is a connection. So the stress can impact on this. And exercise is very important. And where you live is also very important to have the important bacterial communities. So fecal microbial transplantation is one of the technology today. It's something like, I mean, it's very, um, uh, what do you call, um, not acceptable by the new uh, generation. You know, like I isolate the fecal thing from the another person and able to uh, 
understand the nature of the uh, microbiome in the feces and try to purify and inoculate to another person like a capsule. So this is now one of the interesting treatment in many countries and expensive also. I think in Singapore, they're charging around 30 to 40,000 Singapore dollars, which is around uh, how much? Around 2 million Indian rupees, almost 2 million Indian rupees, 20 lakhs. So what are the current challenges? So current challenges to the microbial communities are, you know, you're getting older, so you tend to change the nature, so try to protect them. That's why we give in the form of a, a, a probiotics or prebiotics and probiotics together in the form of a symbiotics. So that could be always been uh, reformulated in your system without changing the actual nature of your gut. And the stress is another factor. Lack of vitamin D and C, which is going to be the major cause of many diseases in the future. Inflammation, poor gut immunity, vascular disorders, epigenetic factors. So this is another interesting thing. You know, how your lifestyle, the food you eat or whatever you do, how it's going to affect the overall nature of your genome. Small nourishment. And now the most killing thing, which me and Ilongo, I think during our PhD time, we never even thought about these things like social isolation can trigger your genetic mechanism. So you tend to isolate yourself. So now that we are getting older, I'm realizing this. When you are isolated, right, there could be a lot of genetic changes happening in your system. Family isolation, your family disposed you. Without your liking, they throw you out and put you in, in an orphanage home. And now there is a proof that your genetic nature has been changing to some extent. Abnormal consumption of antibiotics and other pills like steroids and NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like uh, brufen, ibuprofen, statins, paracetamol, panadol. So seven ways you might be able to harm your immune system, like consumption of alcohol, now it's becoming common now, you know, or yellow book. If you don't drink and uh, you're unfit to live in the society, uh, I think I'm sure still Ilango uh, is, is the same Ilango and myself is the same. We have never even touched even beer in our life. Yeah, I'm going to be 60 now. Now alcohol is becoming a common thing. I go to my own society in my hometown. They say, you don't drink. You're in Singapore. That means Singapore means must drink. America means drink more. Cocktails. What does it mean? Lack of sleep. That one is okay. Me and Ilango still have lack of sleep because we work hard. Unhealthy diet. What do you mean by unhealthy diet? The youngsters are now, including my daughter, she's a lawyer now, she's 25 years. Unhealthy diet means what? Go with the friends, eat supper. 1 a.m., go to McDonald's and uh, Burger King and have the supper at 1 a.m. And imagine how your body is going to take the nature of the microbiome. And dehydration is a very important thing. So you need to rehydrate all the time, especially during the summer. Lack of exercise, smoking. And my dear friends, yeah, I think Elongo must, must have demonstrated, each smoke, the cigarette has got 1146 toxic chemical, 1146 toxic chemicals have been identified so far. When I was doing my degree, it was only a few hundred. My, my lecture always tells cigarette has got more than 200 toxic chemicals. Now we know it's 1146. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure about tomorrow. As if today I'm telling you. I just referred Google again. Among this 1146 toxic chemicals, right, there's one interesting thing is called, I always tell my biomedical students, there is a tar, you know. Tar is a chemical present in the cigarette. So the tar in the cigarette and the tar on the road is the same. So I tell my students, don't waste money if anybody sees a smoking, right? Go with the nail, take the tar and put in the mouth. Why oh, you want to waste money and change your microbiome? Next one is your stress and anxiety. So these are the most important things which we need to educate our young children. We need to educate our new communities, our, our school children to, to prevent all these things. So these are the things which could change. So the bottom line is, again, remember the take home message is that when you change your microbiome, that's it. You need to alarm yourself. Harmless to harmful, abundant use of antibiotics could be harmless to harmful, and also you tend to create a kind of a reservoir of a harmless, uh, sorry, harmful bacteria that could be more dangerous. And imagine we have about few hundred antibiotics now, 
you can group all the antibiotics into 10 different families now. Among the 10 different families, right, you can group them into five different ways of action. That's all. So antibiotics can function on your body with the five different ways of action only. So imagine a day is going to come, almost every bacteria and a virus, I mean, we don't treat uh, antibiotics for viruses and some fungus and parasites. Imagine they all become resistant. Where do, where do you go then? Where do you go then? The only solution is the probiotics. And you need to have the very interesting and very strong gut system if you really want to escape all these uh, challenges from the microbial community. Some interesting challenges like Helicobacter pylori, it can uh, cause so much of uh, clinical symptoms like you know, heartburn, GERD, gastroesophageal disease, gastric ulcer, duodenal ulcer, anemia, IBS. And the most interestingly, it causes a simple inflammation, redness in the uh, stomach, in the, in the antrum or carpus region. And it causes the gastric ulcer or duodenal ulcer. Most of the time, the gastric ulcer can be treated. Uh, sorry, duodenal ulcer can be treated. I'm sorry. Gastric ulcer can become gastric cancer. So that could attach the intestinal lining and then trigger. You, you, you drill and go inside the stomach and cause the damage, create a kind of ammonia atmosphere by having enzyme called urease and come out. Again, go inside, damage and come out. So imagine this, if this is happening chronically, you become, you tend to become a person with a duodenal or gastric ulcer. Most of the time, gastric ulcer will take about three to five years or 10 years to become gastric cancer. So what stage you're going to be, nobody knows. So there are experiments to prove that the Helicobacter pylori can be completely nullified or can completely be eradicated by lactobacillus. So it's very interesting to have the lactobacillus in the uh, probiotics. So there is a gut-brain connection. 70% of your immunity is in the gut system. 90% of your serotonin begins in the gut. Serotonin converts into melatonin and also help you to sleep properly. Anxiety and depression can be controlled by this. So Long-term effects from this, depression, anxiety, panic disorders, hallucinations, paranoia. You don't trust anybody. You always doubtful, you know. So there is a need for a good supplement. So supplements can help you to reduce your stress, reduce obesity, increase resistance to allergy and basic immunity, increase the brain power, change your behavior. So there's a gut-brain axis, which is very interesting to connect yourself from the gut system to the, the brain. And there are a lot of advantages between this gut microbiome and gut-brain axis. It's like um, lactobacillus rhamnosus and um, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis have also been proven that the gut-brain connection can be overcome. This is uh, one of the interesting things can also cause by GE, Japanese encephalitis virus. This inflammation of the brain. Last time it, we simply call brain fever, you know, but it, it has been proven that uh, the interesting brain connection can alarm the human body to overcome the uh, problems in the gut brain connections. And autism and microbiome, there are some link has been there, but not so much has been proven. So I, I'm not going to. Uh, debate of this because autism is most of the time tend to create a lot of debates. So stress and emotions can affect your limbic system in the brain and can cause the damages. You can see here the list of problems and it can change the nature of your gut microbiome and altered microbiome composition, which is normal and helpful, they tend to get altered. So the stress affect the brain, you tend to get psychological disorder, abnormal behavior, cognition problems, like learning disorders, anxiety, possibility of autistic and also visceral pain. And that comes through the neuronal message, endocrine message, and also immune message. When you have a good gut-brain connection, you can overcome these problems. Healthy status to the stress status, vital for homeostasis. Bidirectional signaling between the gastrointestinal tract and also the brain is regulated at the neuronal, hormonal, and also immunological level. Brain and gut enteric microbiota. 
we can have the neuroendocrine function, neuroimmune, sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic, and also enteric nervous system. This has been more linked with the gut system. So bidirectional communication network, the signals from the brain can influence the motor, sensory and secretory modalities of the GI tract. So gut microbial communities can manipulate your mind. Certain species of gut, for example, bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, bacteria can interact with our nervous system in different ways that appear to affect our stress response. And the stress response can affect the gut microbial flora. Even I have been telling my daughter, sometimes she used to get stressed because she started the law profession. In Singapore, it's a very stressful job. I'm giving her probiotic now. I can see she's my first guinea pig. And I can see there's some change. Even today, she's going to fly in another few hours' time. She told Dad, can you help me to get this uh, at least 10 packets of the probiotic you have? So I just gave her. And then I only started my talk here. So that's like, for example, okay, now the new generation at least started believing. You know? My point is, if I convince or if I scientifically prove my daughter, then I can convince the whole world. Because she is such a person, always put a lot of questions. And she doesn't trust anything just like that. So that's, I'm so happy that she just now told me she's going to fly in another two hours time. She just say, can you help me to pack a few packets of uh, the probiotics you have? I was so happy that. I mean, that gives me a positive signal. Fine, okay, the products are working well. So that microbiota and IBD, irritable bowel syndrome, can balance your pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. So microbiome and cardiovascular disease, as I mentioned earlier, right, the important alteration is that the diet and also the epigenetic factors and other uh, interesting cardiovascular enzyme markers can play a role. So that could be regulated by most of the gut microbial communities. So a lot of reports on these things keep on coming up. So bacteriotherapy using a Clostridium difficile, probiotics in the treatment of GI tract, like eradicate H. pylori, treat IBD, irritable bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, and lactose intolerance, diarrhea, inflammation, and metagenomics can also help to study the genomic material recovered from the environmental samples and also from the, the gut system or any other part of the body to understand the actual, uh, what do you call, the genetic pattern of microbial systems or microbiome. So direct sequencing of the microbes in their natural, which we don't do here, but I am just telling you, this is mostly from the scientific reports, bypassing the need for isolation of the laboratory and cultivation. So where in different environmental conditions where you can locate this uh, source of microbial communities like oral cavities and the rhizoids, plant sources, marine sources, and marine algae is one of the rich source for a um, lot of probiotics. Why metagenomics? It's a novel natural products, new uh, antibiotica, and also uh, the nature. New molecules, the new functions, new enzymes and the bioactive molecules, and diversity of life, and different genomes are there, interplay between human and microbes. How do microbial communities work and how stable are they? This is another interesting thing. You need to really locate the stable microbial communities for your probiotics. So methods to study the microbial communities, like why, uh, which microbes are there, and then go for nucleic acid uh, analysis. What are the microbes doing? We can do RNA analysis, proteins and metabolites, and DNA sequencing. So all can be achieved through um, sickness or RNA uh, analysis and also through the metagenomics. So now that uh, if this is successful, then the treatment will be very good. No need to pay so much. Oral microbial community transplantation is possible. Fecal transplantation is also possible. And treating GI disorder in children with autism using microbiota transplant therapy. This is a report from Arizona State University. There is a 
getting a possibility that even to touch the uh, the basic uh, genetic problems. Okay, so the miracles can happen. So mental health conditions linked with the gut microbial genome. So an imbalance of bacteria in the gut microbiome can have serious consequences in the GI tract and also your mental health. In fact, researchers have discovered that people with certain digestive disorders have a high risk of depression and anxiety. So you need to really balance your gut system to avoid any future uh, shock and stress. Microbiota can utilize trimethylamine, N-oxide, and uh, short-chain fatty acids, and also primary and secondary bile pathways to get into CVD, avoid it. By affecting these living cells, uh, microbiota can cause the heart failure, atherosclerosis, hypertension, myocardial fibrosis and infarction, coronary artery disease. So another interesting factor, which this is my one of my most favorite topic is the dementia and gut microbiome. How do we help them? So a growing body of evidence suggests that the dysbiosis, you know, there's a change in the nature of symbiotic or probiotic or microbiome in the gut system associated with the neuro, the degenerative, a neuroprogressive disorder, and also Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So researchers have identified gut microbial bacteria that are associated with the dementia and also the Levi bodies. So Levi bodies are interesting proteins that could be a kind of a earlier marker. You know, it's not coming to the real diagnostic tool, but there is a possibility that uh, Levi's body can um, open the key for. I mean, if a key to open as a diagnostic marker for. Uh, future dementia. So changing the levels of bacteria like uh, Collinsella, Ruminococcus, and the Bifidobacterium may delay the onset of progression of this neurodegenerative disorder. That gives a single, uh, I mean, a kind of a signal to a single pathway that, you know, if you could alter the pathway or nature of these microbial communities, you can uh, touch the doors of dementia as well. So, gut microbiota, a novel therapeutic target for Parkinson's disease. There are reports coming up now. So any remedies for uh, health and gut immunity from our side? We need to thank uh, Machnikov for the fermentation technology. So the solution is the probiotics, which are living organisms promoted with clients that they provide health benefits. Probiotics are considered generally safe to use. Probiotics are live bacteria and sometimes yeast and some um, viruses also, but we don't use so much. We usually think of these as a germs that can cause the disease, but they are uh, harmless and useful and healthy bacteria. Most common example is in the GI tract. So the probiotics and prebiotics can alter the composition of the organisms in the gut microbiome. Prebiotics is, my dear friends, is a food for the probiotic bacteria. So when you have the uh, probiotic or what we call symbiotics, you combine the probiotic bacteria and also like, for example, uh, a pectin and a few other composition that could be acting like a food for these uh, probiotic bacteria like lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium, et cetera. And uh, you can combine that in your probiotic mixture and that you can mix with the water and you can drink. That could be possible that uh, the prebiotics can act like a food for the probiotic bacteria for a few uh, days for them to establish. So once they establish and, uh, and form a kind of a symbiotic relationship between the host and uh, the microbial communities, right? So then the number can become more and more. And they could simply uh, avoid the other harmful or uh, the useless bacteria to get away from your system. So they could even cause a lot of damages by your uh, thinking power, your capacity to decide on things. So there are a lot of these miracles are going to happen from the uh, probiotics. So pro prebiotics is a source of food for the microbial community. So mostly they could be carbohydrates. So they go to your lower digestive tract where they act like a food to help the bacteria. So they can come from Fermented soy products, applied cedar vinegar, kefir, kimchi, chips, yogurt. Yogurt is the most predominant. We have been using yogurt for many, many, how to say, thousands of years. So 
prebiotic and probiotic. So probiotics are live bacteria, promote good uh, digestive system, sensitivity to heat, and can treat with all kinds of uh, irritable bowel disease and syndromes. Probiotics are specialized plant fiber like apple, pectin, uh, and so on, support the healthy digestion, not affected by heat, so may help in the chronic digestive disorder and also inflammatory bowel diseases. You can get them from asparagus, bananas, berries, broccoli, celery. So there are a lot of challenges going to happen, so we need to be careful. And you can appreciate that the probiotics live throughout our entire body, especially your gut system, and more especially in the intestinal tract and your skin and other parts of the body. And please remember that there is a gut-brain connection. The brain communicate with the and also gut communicate back to brain, likewise your heart and your liver and also your uh, respiratory system and also the intestinal lining of the gut. So when you have the most efficient gut system, you can overcome most of the diseases. So thank you so much for the attention. And later on, I'll be so happy to share any questions. Thanks so much for the attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Tamodaran. So it is almost 15 minutes over the allotted time for you, but still I couldn't control myself. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking over to Dr. Vikram. And uh, really, Vikram, you can take your time. Uh, we want to hear a lot from you with particular setup. Now that we have heard enough from Dr. Kamur on the basic science about the bacteria and the prebiotic systems, no to Dr. Uh, thank you very much, Ilango, uh, for giving me the, and everybody at my gym for this invitation. And uh, fabulous uh, talk by Dr. Damodaran. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, really, really, you know, you've covered everything really exhaustively. Uh, I'll basically be talking prominently of the clinical applications. Let me just share the screen one minute. Hello, is, is everybody able to see my screen? Uh, Not yet, sir. I no. can see only the screen uh, broadcast. Um, yeah, now we can see some uh, everything on our screen, including notifications. I think you need to change the disable one second. Think, change uh, to presentation mode. Able to see this now? Yes, sir. Yes. So um, basically, I think uh, after I'm mean, being a clinician and being predominantly a surgical gastroenterologist and a hepatobiliary surgeon, for me, the main interest does lie predominantly where we see manifestations of the human gut microbiome in our direct clinical practice. What I have been, these are my experiences and these are my short. I know the thing which I think I'd like to share with both the basic science people, uh, where is going to be the use case, and ultimately where the basic science, the research, everything comes together to something that we can directly deliver at the bedside of our patients. I'm going to go about it very simply. I think I've given a similar kind of discussion with the uh, MyGene team also earlier. So one of the, some of the most common clinical practice scenarios we see that what we see in a gastro clinic. We see dyspepsia with resistance to H. pylori treatment, very, very common all across the world, very common in our, in our Indian uh, society. In places, we have up to 80% incidence. 
Then the other person that we call as a kind of a failed ICU patient, these are patients who keep drifting in and out of critical care scenarios. These are patients who have got multi-system involvement. There is a breakdown of their bar mucosal barriers, very, very high doses of antibiotics being uh, delivered to these individuals and maximum disruption to their natural human uh, microbiome. Food and allergies and intolerance, something that, you know, as we were all growing up, is something that we really didn't see or, you know, uh, kind of give much importance to. But if you look at the younger generation, I have small kids of my own. It's like, you know, everywhere you go, people are talking about lactose intolerance, glutose intolerance, there are multiple food allergies, their ability to eat just normal food is becoming greater and greaterly impaired. The other is uh, cancer patients. These are patients who we see now much wider range of uh, oncology presentations, younger and younger presentations, and also now slowly creeping into places which were traditionally not what we called, you know, the high incidence areas, even India included. So there are probably new etiological triggers that we are looking at. The other is in the patients, like I already mentioned, in the presence of people with obesity and metabolic syndrome, we have a very large population of diabetics, and that seems to be in hand in hand with the whole metabolic syndrome and obesity pandemic. We are seeing a large number of patients now, you know, of these patient category. Inflammatory bowel disease, again, a disease we didn't see very commonly in our population, but now a very high incidence. And we are seeing a very, very mixed presentation, very not classical of what we used to see, the classic Crohn's or the classic ulcerative colitis. We're now seeing a large number of what we call indeterminate colitis. These are people probably with a greater component of just dysmicrobinemia. So what has been our clinical approach? I mean, it's been quite straightforward. We've cut out antibiotics. We use a pre and probiotic uh, process. We give nutrition. We've got some clinical testing, which basically goes by, you know, imaging, a biopsy, or serum markers for information. This has been basically a stock approach to these patients. So when I see a patient like this, one, one of these categories in my clinic, this is what we'd probably do straight off, you know, as a clinical approach. My question, and that is what I would like to also look at, uh, you know, everyone going forward, is how can we make this approach more targeted, more specific, and actually more effective? So one of the most common and extremely you know, dangerous conditions we see is Clostridium difficile. I mean, we see this very, very commonly in a lot of our ICU patients. We see this, uh, I get called in as a gastro specialist to see people who are you know, extremely toxic, who have come in primarily from various other ICU you know, scenarios with probably uh, you know, other system involvement, later on get very, very high doses of antibiotic the gut mucosal barrier breaks down because enteric feeding breaks down. And then they have an overgrowth of clostridium difficile. And when they present, they are usually quite morbidly ill. They have multiple abdominal symptoms. They could even have, you know, go up to a situation where sometimes we've had even people who have gone on to develop perforations and peritonitis. The other most day-to-day -day kind of practice scenario where we see dysmicrobemia causing a clinical presentation is H. pylori very much like what uh, Dr. Damodhan had presented. We see from the simple thing of people developing dyspepsia to people developing peptic ulcers to actually having the complication of peptic ulcers like bleeds. Now, what is classic of all these patients are standardly in clinical practice, you know, most clinicians, we do have a very much a knee-jerk uh, response. We don't really like, we like, most doctors would like to have a very cause and effect kind of response. I see this, I give this. So, you know, we by and large see late identification of these dysmicrobemias. We have one standard approach for all of them. And then for many of these patients, we don't have a long-term follow-up. That is, we are not looking at these patients getting back to normal, you know, uh, microbiome uh, re-establishment. So these patients are seen very episodically. Uh, certain, you know, processes are in, you know, in started for these people, but in most of our clinical scenarios, we don't look at these patients very often. So we see this very often in the critical care scenario, wherein patients come, they will somehow go or leave the hospital from the critical care 
ICU scenario alive, but usually will come back with a secondary infection two to three weeks later. Very largely because many of the problems of the bowel have not been addressed. This, you know, uh, uh, the complete disarray of the microbiome in the gut, poor nutrition are not looked into and there's not been followed up later on and very low clinical awareness that this could be a problem that will make people's condition worse. The last one is very important to me because, you know, I just get a standard of, you know, labeled uh, dispension to me. I would like something that is more tailor-made to my patient based on what is the disruption that has happened to that person's microbiome. So as I said, what is important for me as a clinical wish list? I would look at probably two, three issues. I want something that is able to be, you know, give me a diagnosis fast. I want to know which is the patient I need to intervene quickly other than only my clinical judgment. Something that's bedside that is easily done. Sensitivity and specificity, which is high. I want an, a clinical test, which gives me the fact that my patient is suffering from a dysmicrobemia, which is actionable. It is reproducible. I should be able to do it again and again. And I should be able to follow up the patient with the tool to their normalcy. To be able to now say that we established their gut microbiome to normalcy. The other thing is to be able to take the individual into consideration. We are now looking at a very broad criteria. And I'd like to give this example again. And we have a few patients that I just want to share. I mean, I've got uh, the thing which we've done along with my gene. Uh, new uh, in enterprises, which we've now started our own study. We've seen that, you know, people come to us in the gastro clinic with such a varied expression of symptomatology. We are now basically trying to club them into broad groups and treat them broadly. And many a time, these just don't work. So we have now the ability to have a more targeted approach, which is what I want the individualization of the treatment to be started. We also need to have clear endpoints being defined as what is the beginning and the end of our treatment and what is the simplicity with which we can communicate this to our patient and peer groups. Now, what do we want from a gut microbiome analysis? As I said, simplicity, actionability, it should be educated to the patient and the doctor on what are the points we want to carry out, what is the end point of our treatment and what is going to be the long-term treatment and lifestyle modifications to these individuals. Because to a person who is either obese or a person with Crohn's disease, these are patients you know, who have got a lifestyle problem and a lifelong issue that they're going to have to handle. And the support has to be really something that is on a long-term basis. As uh, Dr. Damodaran has already you know, uh, highlighted and told us, the inner galaxy is what I call. It is absolutely a huge amount of information. Now, at the clinical end of the spectrum, it is almost sometimes bewildering to us. To me, as a doctor, if I have to sit and understand the whole complexity of it, I don't think I will be able to really put my head around the, you know, all the data that I will get. So we have to be able to have you know, a very different approach. A lot of lateral uh, you know, specialties coming in, people with big data analysis, AI with machine learning to bring in how we can identify patterns very rapidly, virtual model models on which we can either identify disease patterns or therapeutic you know, interventions which work, and also be able to clinically sensit, you know, sensitize clinicians to the you know, kind of data that will be derived from having so much to study and so much to learn. So this is a kind of a rough graph of the total or the complete you know, analysis of the gut microbiome. It is absolutely astoundingly complex and astoundingly diverse. And any, you know, data which has such, you know, uh, is, is so heavy with data and is so heavy with, you know, diversity is going to be extremely difficult for the individual clinician at the bedside to be able to be patient to read it and deliver it to, you know, some sort of clinical actionable work it becomes extremely difficult unless it is simplified to the ability how we can make this you know more easy for us to assimilate 
So this is one of the ways in which you know we look at all the aspects. We have a developmental model. We have a predictive model. We are able to look at how the clinical implementation is possible. So it's basically like creating a workflow analysis and finding out how we can use all of this massive amounts of data that we will generate and actually come to a point where we can actually deliver a very, very clear clinical endpoint to our patients. I just want to highlight two or three patients we've you know, been handling together along with Neom. And the first case is actually a 26-year-old male was of a mixed diet, normal to slight overweight BMI of 26. He had a history of recurrent upper respiratory tract infections for which he had been to numerous you know, pulmonologists, ENT specialists, and had been on multiple courses of antibiotics about six months back before he came to meet me. Now he had developed a situation where he had intractable diarrhea, his diarrhea and abdominal pain. He would not respond to any kind of treatment. He had lost tremendous amounts of weight. There was also suspicion that he had developed a malignancy and the man was frankly depressed and was no longer able to keep his job. So when he came to us, we did a standard. If you look at all his markers, all were more or less within normal limits. His colonoscopy was actually relatively normal. Stool analysis was normal. Even his CDF was not relatively normal. But when he did his gut microbiome analysis, as we got it from, you know, in collaboration, you see, you know, this patient's gut, which is on the left side and the normal gut on the right side, you see there is a complete lack. There is an overgrowth of particular organisms. There is a complete lack of the normal diversity of organisms that we would normally see in a normal person who resides in Bangalore. So that is the first thing that his, now his, his gut is now colonized by one instead of having a healthy diversity of the normal gut flora. His analysis showed us that he had predominantly actually an overgrowth of pseudomonas in his gut. So we gave him targeted therapy for that. And we also put him on a long course of probiotics and prebiotics. It took him almost six to eight weeks to normalize. And today he is actually with no intervention, but only on continued probiotics and on a particular diet with a nutritional supplement and is doing extremely well, beginning to gain weight and is actually back to his work. The second was a case of a lady, it was a 77 year old lady who was a vegetarian, who was a non-smoker, non-alcoholic, who had had a surgery for a gastroduodenal artery aneurysm, or surgery that I had done for her almost 15 years back. She had become diabetic, but she had developed a kind of recurrent loose stool and her diabetes was becoming less and less controllable. A colonoscopy and stool was normal. So we took, and all these patients, we've done colonoscopies at the time, we do a colonic mucosa biopsy. And you see the pattern again. There is a predominance of one organism, a loss of the biodiversity that we would see in the normal gut flora in this person. And we, in this lady, we got a Klebsiella overgrowth compared to all the others. Again, we did specific interventions on a probiotic and prebiotic and specific nutrition. And we got her back to normal. So what I'm trying to highlight is, and both these patients are people who had actually gone, you know, from pillar to post to multiple clinics, trying to find answers to where, what was going wrong. So I basically want to say that from the gastrointestinal point of view, as a doctor, we are seeing very, very clear evidence about how the normal gut flora protects our normal life and how we are able to have a normal existence and have normal, uh, you know, what I would say, homeostasis within our bodies, courtesy a normal gut flora. As Dr. Damodraman highlighted, it is our lifestyle, our diet, our diseases, our addictives, our environment, our quality of food, our food habits, all of which in a multifactorial way are changing this gut microbiome into something that is abnormal and is having a long-term prognostic issue with us. We are going to see this making, uh, uh, you know, affecting people, reducing their productivity, prolonging disease states, raising hospital bills, raising healthcare bills for people. And therefore, this is going to become a critical intervention in the future. 
to how to re-establish these people into getting back to having a normal homeostasis and normal gut microbiome. We have some tools, we have pre and probiotics that we have, we've got fecal uh, transplantation that is also there. But I believe we still have a huge amount of work to understand the problem, but also not only just understand the problem, search for a simple, elegant solution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Vikram, for giving a wonderful uh, presentation on the clinical point of view, how important this gut microbiome is. I see two case studies, and you have uh, really highlighted the importance of the gut microbiome. And I would like to uh, emphasize and highlight a point here is these studies, and we are happy that Dr. Vikram used uh, our product called Insta Preserve. Uh, which is uh, a solution, the gel form, which can, you can collect and store the samples, your biospecimens at room temperature. And these samples were collected in that. That the importance of using this is when you collect the specimen, by the time you store and transport to the lab, considerable amount of that information, in this case, the microbial population, you will lose it because of the, the transport and storage conditions. But if you use the uh, insert preserve like uh, the gel, we uh, can preserve the samples. All the informations are well preserved from the point of collection, so that when we use. And here at MyGene and uh, GNU, we have done this gut microbiome analysis for Dr. Vikram uh, using the next generation sequencing system. We identified and we provided the thing, and really happy that. It's really helped him in the clinical uh, analysis and the treatment and the results are really good. And from our side, from the basic science side, we are really happy that we are part of these case studies and the really gut microbiome analysis is helping a lot in the clinical perspective. I thank both Dr. Tamodran and Dr. Vikram for sharing their wonderful knowledge and experience with us. We will take a few questions from the thing and uh, Dr. Satyanath from National Institute of Naturopathy from Pune. And they are very much interested now key on working with us on epigenetics and microbiome in uh, yoga and naturopathy. He has asked an important, uh, an interesting question that, uh, that have, just having a milk, cow milk or buffalo milk, whether this will increase uh, the, or bring back the normal flora in the gut. So that is his question. Will consumption of milk, either cow or buffalo, promote healthy microbiota or other way around? So that is a question from him. And also, from this point of view, as a naturopathy, they don't go with the drug treatment. It is based on the yoga, meditation, and the fasting, the changing the food and the lifestyle. And the second uh, question is, uh, how uh, prescribing a fasting for a person will reverse or it will alter the uh, gut microbiome status? So that is his question. Over to Dr. Uh, Vikram. So uh, <clears throat> thank you for that question. Uh, so the, I think there are two things. I think consumption of milk uh, in any format, we definitely do see the fact that the amount of lactobacillus that is there naturally in milk is helpful. However, if you look at most people consuming milk, the milk is highly treated also. So uh, if you look at it as a food product or a derivative of milk, definitely milk in the form of curds where you know, the per gram lactobacillus is higher, will be more beneficial as a probiotic, in my opinion. So that is one aspect. So where there is a certain amount of a fermentation process added to that process. So that is one aspect of what I would suggest. Second is the process of fasting to, the, to re-establish uh, a pattern. The issue about looking at how fasting affects our GI tract so it goes back to the fact that if you look at the fact of the human evolution, we are basically hunter-gatherers. 
and we have adopted our feeding habits to our modern society and modern employment so we we have become a, a race or a, or a species that has become we don't eat based on hunger we eat based on time so sometimes we may not necessarily be hungry but we are eating so this kind of adapted behavior has caused a change in our gi tract it would be ideal and in fact there are very good studies to say that what we call a need based diet where people eat when they are hungry would be probably the best thank you so much uh, now over to dr jini nayar she did her msc in biomedical genetics and phd in clinical genetics so then uh, i just answered uh, dr tamodaran's question about her background now we go to dr jini to ask the other questions to the speakers so we have few questions we'll just take a couple of them um so one question from sanjay shrinivasan so he wants to know what is the role of next generation sequencing in understanding gut microbiome okay you you like you want me to answer this or <clears throat> yes first you can answer then uh, we will ask in a different way to dr vikram so this is more promising technique as uh, i i just indicated in my talk you don't have to culture the bacteria and all that you can go for the real uh, source of sampling like uh, collect the stool or you can have uh, a kind of a swab from the mouth or any region even if it is a environmental sample you just have the sample and you have the technique to uh, precipitate the the bottom line of it and from there you can go for sequencing so that will give you a kind of a broad spectrum analysis and then from there you need to really uh, find out what could be the you know the genus and species level of uh, the microbiome so that's my understanding but before that i will go into that i just see one interesting question uh, of somebody like uh, ankit ankit is asking mother to child microbiome transfer could be one of the reason of obesity of the kid so there is a possible link from the experimental evidence we have seen that mother to um, fetus obesity probably due to the mother has got probably the obese uh, nature or the obese physiology or anatomical uh, thing and from there it's been adaptively they will might be having a obese uh, microbial or microbiome and that could be like we transfer the microbiome from the mother to fetus right so you are transferring obviously the uh, <clears throat> the obese microbiome so probably the children may have the uh, obesity from the mother as well there's a possibility we can't rule out the possibility so yeah next question what about the natural probiotic like curd etc how can they help us the curd has been using we have been using that as the natural uh, natural reservoir for lactobacillus yeast and a few species of candida as well so they are most beneficial and uh, the the question is that there are some school of thought they say that uh, the lactobacillus present in the yogurt is a dead one but uh, we can prove using our simple experiment that the yogurt contains the lactobacillus and a few other species which are live in fact so as uh, dr vikram explained you can have you know like a yogurt in the, in the form of a curd and all that that could be one of the natural probiotics but then the question is that uh, coming on to the modern living right how many of uh, the new generation they they know how to make yogurt or where to go and buy yogurt and then when you go and buy the commercial one even there is a possibility of a lot of preservatives right so you need to go for again think about a good a probiotic and uh, Uh, prebiotics uh, together in the form of a symbiotics so that could be more natural you don't have any kind of a preservatives and other ingredients so give it in the form of a nature then it it's more acceptable that could be an alternate way for yogurt yogurt is the best i mean there's no doubt about it thank yeah you, thank you sir this question is from ankit to dr vikram where do you see the bottleneck towards applying microbiome or metagenomics in routine or 
especially when pricing of next generation sequencing and related analysis are coming down drastically. So I think the the uh, I would put is I can't put it as any single bottleneck. I think first of all, um, it's not widely um, understood that you look look at microbiome analysis in a clinical setting. Uh, the fact that it should penetrate into our clinical practice is something that we are not yet very well, uh, uh, and the acceptance level is low there from the clinical angle. That is one. The next I would say is the sheer availability of the testing. Uh, you know, because I have tried up and, you know, I'm looking at it specifically, we are doing it at least here, but it's not commercially easily available. The next is actually the uh, aspect of costing which is something that, you know, is in India, extremely a cost sensitive scenario. And therefore we need to have a test, which is, you know, a rapid can't have very long turnaround times because you're going to be, you know, I look at the first adopters being of this uh, whole microbiome analysis being two, two spectrums. One spectrum would be people who would be actually coming in, looking for the wellness aspect or predominantly coming in from the wellness industry. Uh, there you will have a lot of freedom to act because these are people who are got uh, you know a better budget to use and it's more of a lifestyle choice so they tend to be you know more comfortable with their payments but people who come in from a clinical practice where they are coming in from a hospital setting these are people who are usually you know like the patients i'd mentioned they have actually gone through many many clinical scenarios and have burnt out their money to a great extent so making the cost effectiveness of this testing is going to be very critical for its adoption. You know, to be adopted, it has to be very financially well priced. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. So the other question, I'm not able to see who has written that. Okay, Anuman, I think. Okay, he wants to know uh, if the gut microbiome can influence the metabolic disorders. Damodar can, can answer this. Yeah, can. Yeah, gut microbiome, in fact, uh, it, 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 it might have a lot of influence on metabolic disorders because it could um, help you to synthesize vitamin B12, vitamin K, and also induces your uh, rate of uh, anabolism and catabolism and also promote the digestion as well. So it will have a definitely a strong impact on the basic metabolism of the GI tract. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Other question? See, how these probiotics can be designed? Is it really challenging or it could be easily customized from the patient to patient case? That's a question from Vidhikesh. Okay. So, Dr. Vikram, you want to say or can I start? I think, I mean, because I'll, I'll set, I can probably answer it from the point of what I want. Yes. So I, I put it this way. Uh, I put it as a comparison to something like uh, how a diabetic is treated. We all know that we have an array of insulins that we have. And based on what the patient's symptom, I mean, level of diabetes is or insulin sensitivity is, that insulin dose is titrated. As a clinician, I would like to have a probiotic which I can titrate. That's that's my answer to my that's my what I would say by my wish list. Something like an insulin, something that I can titrate according to my patients. Sure. So I mean to add on to Dr. Vikram's point, it's more analytical, but, but uh, the broad spectrum way is it is it is too tedious to understand what are the microbial communities we are going to include in the probiotics. It's quite challenging. But then uh, like people like uh, Ilango and um, a Jenny team, right, uh, from the MyGene, probably they can think about this uh, sickness RRNA-based uh, complete genome sequencing and all that. That might help us to choose and pick and choose the, the type of uh, organisms we are going to include in the thing. What we have done here is based on um, the fact that, you know, a lot of uh, published reports and the beneficial effect by proven by other uh, scientific communities, right? So we have designed and we picked and chose a few of the what you call microbial communities, starting from uh, families of bifidobacterium and uh, lactobacillus. 
So, but we included uh, two genus and five species. So totally we put about uh, three bifidobacterium and two lactobacillus species, totally five. And uh, to add with that, we have a few other ingredients, which are natural ingredients to help and support the GI tract. So that can give us a kind of a full um, probiotics. In addition to that, we have uh, uh, apple pectin and a few other six different ingredients to function like um, uh, what do you call pro, I mean prebiotics. So both the pre and the probiotics together, we call it as a symbiotics. So that can give you a complete uh, modality for, as uh, Dr. Vikram mentioned about the titration. So this is giving you uh, overall adaptation for your source. Yeah. An interesting question from uh, Sri. How do you differentiate or have a preference of spore former compared to the natural gut bacteria? I think he is meaning the fungal, fungal infections. So how does it uh, differentiate? How much of yeast probiotics prefer to bacterial probiotics? How do you differentiate the preference of a spore former to the natural gut bacteria. So normally, right, most of the, uh, this the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium we have used, they are non-spore farmers. So probably some of the natural, uh, what you call the manufacturers, they don't use the spore farmers because spore farming bacteria may be a triggering fact that, you know, the spores can be naturally turned over to become a harmful one. So we, we don't want to include that. Can I, can I just ask the question clearly, Dr. Damodaran and Dr. Belliappa? Yeah. My question about this particular one, which this uh, the, I asked was, because of the temperature stability problem, generally spore formers are the ones which are most predominantly being uh, sold in the market by the marketeers and the formulators. Um, bacillus coagulans, bacillus species, bacillus subtilis, all of these have a, a lot of actually other issues than the cure that they give. So in your current practice, Dr. Paliapa, I would like to ask, do you have any differentiation to use one over the other? Right now, no, no. Frankly, no. No. I, I need to be is very, yeast I probiotic we... preferred over the... Sorry, sorry. Please, please carry on. The second question was, is yeast probiotic more preferred over the bacterial? Uh, as a, I'm sorry, I really don't have an answer for that, to be very, very frank. I, I mean, at the end of the day, we end up using what is commercially available. Yeah. It all depends on uh, the usage uh, and also the, the backup information you have. Like um, what we use uh, here is uh, the one we designed is based on bacteria. Like we used the lactobacillus and the bifidobacteria, we didn't use yeast. So yeast again, probably another reason that uh, you know possibility of uh, adaptation and also maybe other metabolic issues. Whereas the we have we have I mean others have more reports on yeast also, but we have more reports on this bifidobacterium and uh, uh, lactobacillus. So we have adapted to use this one, both the bifido and uh, lactobacillus. So again, as the Dr. Ravikram mentioned, this is based on the need and also based on your choice. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Yeah, sure. Last one question, which is really interesting, I think, because of antibiotic usage, is that if gut microbiome is killed by the action of antibi antibiotic or overdosage of antibiotic, and how to increase the good microbiome in human body? Dr. Vikram, you want to share yes. or you want me to? Yes, no, I, I think I think the first part is, I mean, I think, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say one thing is, one is I think what's very, very important is we need to start getting discretionary use on antibiotic. I think that is the first starting point. I mean, if we are going to continue to use the, the antibiotics the way we do, we're going to get into serious trouble. We already are in serious trouble. That is one. Second issue is that that it is... Uh, what antibiotics does in different levels of the uh, of a patient's you know uh, clinical journey, what we're seeing is sometimes it's not complete annihilation of the uh, gut microbiome, but what we are really seeing is we are seeing a complete change in the diversity of the microbiome of that individual. They are becoming more and more like almost like monocultures rather than you know a, a multiculture or a multi-organism microbiome. 
because one tends to overgrow the other. And that is the reason why I feel we have to look at how are we, what kind of antibiotic protocol results in a certain degree of microbiome change. That is something we are looking at micro and antibiotic resistance. That is something that's being studied quite widely, but we are not looking at this aspect of our antibiotic use. Thank you very much for, uh, I'm thanking both speakers, Dr. Tambodran and Dr. Vikram Bali for a uh, uh, wonderful and illustrative uh, speech and also answering the question. And uh, sorry, Dr. Ilango, there's one yeah. question I think missed out. Let me answer the question. Yeah, somebody somebody called Naveen asked the question, um, whether uh, the children, newborn baby get the microbiome from the womb itself or later. So yeah. to answer this question, when the, when the embryo or the baby is inside the mother's tummy, right, inside the uterus, baby don't get any microbiome. Most of the microbiome comes out, uh, comes to the baby when... Uh, it goes through the, the birth canal, the birth route, and also after the birth, the baby adapts to the mother's milk and also through the mother's milk. So both by birth canal and also by the mother's milk, the baby gets most of the microbiome and not from the um, period that when the baby is inside the womb. So that is the answer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tamodaran. And I also thank the, all the audience for raising the uh, very interesting questions. And I hope we all answered, we have answered all those. We addressed all the questions. And thank you so much. And from my gen Neo, we try to uh, address this clinical issue. That's why we closely associate with the clinicians like Dr. Vikram. And we have already done this gut microbiome with the next generation sequencing studies using 16S DNA RNA uh, sequencing. We identified the organisms and we have provided the gut microbiome report to Dr. Victim, which he has showed in his slides, that report from our lab. So we really feel very happy to see that this kind of a analysis, the gut microbiome really helping in the under the clinical setting. So, and also the product, the insert preserve, which have been used by the clinicians for their real uh, proper diagnostics of the biospecimens so that they don't lose any valuable clinical data what they need. So from MyGene and Neom, we extend the services to them and any researchers, any sci scientist, and the research scholars, they would like to use our product for the research purpose for collection, storage, and transporting their specimens. Any biological samples they can use. Not only that they take this gut microbiome, not only in the clinical setting, even in the veterinary science. For example, the feed conversion ratio where in the, in the dairy cow, when they feed, when it is converted to give effective amount of the meat production, the gut microbiome plays a, uh, a very important role in this, especially the affirmatives. This bacterial species play a leading role in increasing the milk yield. Both in rumen and the lower gut uh, microbiome, they have a very important role. So it's not only the, for human being, it's for the animal, and also in the plant science, the soil bacteria. Mm. All analyzed and we do. We have done the beta biome analysis, identified the bacterial species from all these samples from milk, cow dung, soil, and veterinary samples we have done, agriculture samples we have done, and we have generated the reports and we have provided the basic scientists and the researchers and they make use of it. So from my gene, we can provide these services to everyone and also we to encourage the research community, we provide the training program on this. So the clinical part, we'll provide the training on the clinical side. From the veterinary side, we use the veterinary samples to train them. And the agriculture part, we use the soil and cow dung, metabiome analysis, so that they know they use to their samples. So it is not a general training we provide. We provide the customized uh, training to the 
research scholars and the faculties and also from the industry people we provide the trainings as per their requirement so everyone please feel free to contact us and if you want to have more information from our speakers we will pass on your question to them and we'll get the answer for you and also anyone wants to use our product reserve for storing or even establishing a biobank in your facility you feel free to contact us and once again, I thank everyone, Dr. Tamodran, Dr. Vikram, and all the audience for your wonderful participation and making this webinar as a wonderful session. Thank you so much. From the thank, you. thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ilango. Thank you, Dr. Vikram. Nice to know you. So we'll keep in touch. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Rajini. Thank you. Yeah, thank and you. the team of Myogen people. Thank you so much. Thank you thank so you. much. This Thanks was the first thank webinar you. and we would like to continue this. So the second series of a webinar will be on biobanking. So we will take this forward as a monthly uh, initiative. So every month we will have some uh, innovative talks from speakers like, uh, you, like Dr. Damodar and Dr. Vikram. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.